South Africa is known and documented as one of the most unequal places and Cape Town itself where we are now you just have to fly in on the airplane and you can see how unequal it is you drive from the airport you go past some of the biggest informal settlements in Africa and then you can drive all the way down to the sea and see the the dollar billionaires homes down on the seaboard and then people want to get angry and say well why are there so many homeless people it's like well um during apartheid you weren't allowed to have an education you know you weren't allowed to be in certain areas you were chased you were segregated that's obviously going to still have an impact that's going to have an impact for good and this of course is a, is a great driver of dependent drug use because people are looking for meaning and hope in their life when you're in that much pain Heroin's a great analgesic for a lot of people. He's sitting with people who've got really good reasons to keep using drugs. Inequalities very much in terms of criminalization, in terms of arrest, in terms of the criminal justice is a you by justice, and then in terms of healthcare. Government should place the public health aspect of the drug control more prominently in their agenda. Without uh, these services, uh, drugs are still being used. So why, why can't we just save life? I welcome you to 2023 Africa Policy Week. This particular event has got a history. It is known for sparking change. We need to find solutions which are suitable to our context, to our people, which are driven by motivation from the community rather than imposed. You are part of an event that changes lives through changing policy. It's proven it in the past and we will prove it again. Drug policies must be grounded in, public, in a public health approach based on scientific evidence and respect for human rights and always putting people first. Drug prohibition has failed to achieve its goals of a drug-free world while having detrimental impact on our societies. It is causing far more harm than good. We must stop the practice of arresting people just because they use drugs. <laughs> Governments of our region should consider a variety of reform in drug policy approaches, including decriminalization and legalization. We feel that science can and should play a role not only in strengthening health and human rights approaches to drugs, but also in helping communities to achieve social justice. I am proud to be part of this incredible collective of people charging forward with big ideas to decolonize drug policy, to dismantle the colonial punitive systems that still govern our lives, to remove punitive approaches to health, which also still govern our lives, and to work together to shift power to the global majority. So the apartheid is over, but South Africa is still the most socially unequal country in the world, as far as I know. The dream of a rainbow nation and a shared economy is just lying in shatters, you know, it's all over the place. It, it just hasn't been achieved. The thing that is most noticeable about the South African drug scene is you've got privileged drug users who, who never get caught, they use in very confined spaces, but you've got masses and masses of people using drugs who are living in very economically deprived circumstances and they don't have any resources. There were no harm reduction services up until we started them. People who inject drugs have by far the highest incidence of HIV in the country out of any key population and up to 93% prevalence of hepatitis C in some communities. And only about 1% of people who should get harm reduction services actually get them. What I am seeing, which is really good, is um, a general acceptance that arresting people isn't working. We're also a heavily incarcerated country as well, and recidivism is huge. So yeah, we, we're really getting increased recognition that it's not helpful just to put people in jail. We're getting increased recognition that harm reduction services are essential. So we 
work with people who inject drugs primarily we do behavioral change intervention which is our peer educators that's for other people it's almost like a community leader but it's peer educators who comes through substance use themselves they then interact with the clients to say look since we are a harm reduction program we don't say you must stop using drugs but we do say use it in such a way that it doesn't cause you any further harm then we have we also do HIV testing and then in the event where clients do test positive we link them to care so that they can be on antiretrovirals we offer them a op opiate substitute treatment program which is methadone. We go out in the communities and um, we have set places that we go to, set time frames that we go to see clients and we provide them with clean needles and syringes. Oh, it's a very, very good program because they don't just uh, give us needles, they give us the swipes, they give us the cotton wool, they give us um, a chance not to maybe get a viral disease by using somebody else's old needles. We have our current peers are coming through the program as clients who were using heroin themselves and now they have nine to five jobs. They are working, living by themselves, having a flat, renting, paying the rent. Our community linkage officer will go out into the community and she will sit with the community and she will discuss, like she'll ask you how are you doing today, what has been going on in your life, or how can I assist you? And then they will say, I need to go on the methadone program or I would like to um, get more clean needles. And then Natalie will, um, Natalie, she's a community linkage officer, she will then refer them to the to, uh, TBHV care centre. I love working with my community. I love my community to bits. And a couple of years back, the way I looked and the way I am at this point now, it's, I can, or I actually, I can't believe it myself. The way I look now, it is as far, far. I actually, so to speak, look like the living dead. Walking on, as like almost like just waiting for me to kick the bucket. But the woman support group gave me that um, safe space, that, um, that comfort, and um, they guide me to become the person that I am today. So I am so lucky, I'm happy that I took that step. Because if I didn't take that step, I would have been six feet under because of my experience, my grievances of my mother that I lost. So that's how I started using drugs. And I wanted actually to drag myself to death. But that wasn't in my destiny. So destiny had another purpose for my life. I'm still applying harm reduction to myself. I'm still using, but I am a functional substance user, which can function in a working environment. We as people who do not understand how to treat people with drugs, we need to stop stigmatizing and discriminating. We need to support people and not punish. You know, sometimes I have the feeling that we make such a fuss about drugs because it's so much easier to blame drugs than to address the real issues like inequality and poverty and exclusion and and uh, suffering related to trauma and all this stuff. You're 100% correct. So, so one of the, the things that I say to people is I, I play this thought experiment with them. I said, I want you to imagine your community, but really imagine it. Now just take the drugs out of it. What have you solved? And if people are really thinking about it, they suddenly go, not very much. If we want to reduce the number of people who, who suffer from drug use issues, you know, who are really dependent and don't want to be dependent and that kind of thing. You've got to address the, the structural issues and the economic issues. We ask the wrong question all the time. You know, when you see somebody sitting on the side of the road and they're injecting through an already septic abscess, people go, oh, that person must be sick or what kind of evil is that or they're criminal or whatever. But that's the wrong question. The question we need to be asking is, what is it that makes this the best short-term solution for this person? Because that's what they mean. All of us, we optimize our lives for comfort. And if you are homeless, hungry, infections, you're going to want a really strong analgesic. And that's what heroin is. It's an emotional and a physical analgesic. So if you want to ease people's pain, you can either give them heroin or you can give them hope and, and housing and, and food and that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm 
Mertil, can you just give us a short overview of what happened with uh, cannabis after the decision of the Supreme Court in 2018, right? Yes. So in 2018, the Constitutional Court of South Africa declared that the prohibition of the use and cultivation of cannabis within private spaces was unconstitutional. They did not legalize trade. We were left in this really gray area. Lots of people started to open up private clubs because it was the privacy judgment. We've had about 400 clubs open up around South Africa. And it's really just the roll of the dice, whether the cops arrive or not. So a cannabis private club is a, a collective of like-minded members. You would have a consumption area plus a shop. People would need to join the club and the owner of the club or whoever's running the club, it can be run as a non-profit or it can be run as a for-profit, needs to keep records of their members and then you would keep very specific records about uh, of the of your stock. I think that the, the private club model really, really is the great equaliser because it's not that pot shop with fancy Norwegian wood shop fitting, you know. Let the trade happen in the clubs. You should be able to run that establishment in an exercise book, in a shack, in an informal settlement. Where do you see positive developments in Africa you can report? I've seen Sierra Leone taking steps, they have actually approached civil society to guide them in terms of their commitments in the area of drugs and what can be improved in terms of the law. Civil society has given them a written opinion on that. We have also seen, even though Liberia's law is not really a decriminalization, but we've seen a significant reduction because they were sending people for common use for 15 months, even more, two years. And now for them to reduce it drastically to three months, I believe that as time goes on, probably there might be amendments and people will begin to actually look at that. Gambia is also in the verge of doing that. Gambia has actually started a conversation. They actually have a, a, a bill. We were invited to make inputs to that and we have suggested a few areas they should look at. We've seen an addition of um, some countries doing harm reduction, incorporating harm reduction, for instance. We've seen Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, we've seen Mali, we have seen um, Mozambique, we have seen Mauritius and many other countries that are actually going in the direction of harm reduction. Also, we have seen countries that have also sort of like opened the conversation on cannabis regulation. Uh, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Rwanda. Five years back, you wouldn't see any African country talking about cannabis legalization or regulation, not at all. And so for us to begin to see these things happening, that means the governments are really resonating with the conversation. They have acknowledged the fact that those draconian laws have actually not made an impact and they, be, they need to begin to shift away from those draconian laws. How do you feel? Is there a meaningful dialogue between civil society and decision makers in Ghana? I think over time we have been able to build that strong relationship with government and most of the time when government wants to propose something, they want to see civil society part of that discussion on the table. I think it's a very meaningful relationship which is good. Now we are beginning to see some commitment looking at the drug issue more from the public health perspective and so of course getting the endorsement of the president to support harm reduction. So Ghana will be starting with OST and then gradually will move towards the NSP to provide services for persons who inject drugs. What about the criminalization of uh, drug users? Do you think there will be any change? So you could go to prison for more than five years for just mere possession for personal use. Now with a new law, what it has sought to do is it has scrapped the custodial sentencing and has introduced fines. Yes, of course, it's, it's, it's a progress, but we still feel as civil society that the fines are a little bit hefty, about $160. I don't think they can pay that. So that conversation is still ongoing with um, the minister, the Ministry of Interior, as well as the Narcotics Control Commission to see if we can do some amendments with the current law to at least reduce the fines. I'm really happy that Ghana has been able to pass the bill for 
plantation uh, of um, cannabis and also for medicinal and industrial purposes. But I'm also hoping that we could legalize the recreational use. What would you like to achieve in Zimbabwe? What policy changes you would like to achieve? Currently, the um, uh, drug policies we are having uh, in Zimbabwe are outdated. Uh, they were established during the colonial era. We need uh, decriminalization of people who use and inject drugs. As well, we also need an environment where we can access services so that uh, they can, we reduce the high rate of mortality in our country. What motivated you to start activism in this field? I've how I've been stigmatized, I've been discriminated uh, as, an, as an unactive drug user at that time, and how, how I've been uh, harassed by police. People, how perceiving the people using drugs is different. They see them as a criminal, they see them as people that don't have the right to live. While well, these are human rights, in according to the different international human rights declarations, even from our constitution perspective, everyone has the right to live, everyone has the right to education, everyone has the right to, to access treatment. So you see these people being marginalized in a way that um, they cannot access uh, the different services. That's how it moved me on to become an, uh, an activist. How would you describe or summarize the drug situation, the drug scene in Uganda? The drug situation in Uganda is um, at increase. If the government has not provided targeted services for people who use drugs in five to three years to come, then Uganda we are going to be having a very big um, problems because as a country it has positioned itself on criminalization rather than public health approach. But our dream is to make sure that everyone has a right to access treatment without going through a judicial uh, kind of process. That's our dream, not being handcuffed, paraded before the court, and then the court decides. It's like when you have a son and uh, a daughter and is addicted, and then you want this person to get off drug, then you have to go to police and report yourself. My son or daughter, they are using drugs and I want them to, 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 to get treatment or to go to the rehab. Then the police will, will arrange a day with the judge. Then the judge looks into your matter. That's how the law was. But I think we made our case and the issues are going to be included. It's our prayer to see that everyone who needs services walks, walks direct to the hospital or to the, to the treatment centre, gets the treatment he deserves, and gets better. Have you achieved any success in your advocacy work in, in Kenya? Yes, we have a little, so much so in creating awareness, because we have worked with members of parliament for a long time. The government has uh, recognised people who use drugs as stakeholders. Healthcare is very comprehensive and it's going on, but we have a long way to go when it comes to law enforcement when it comes to the criminal justice system. The motto of our drug authority is actually a drug-free world. So they do it through policing. And we have seen children being expelled from school. We have seen uh, our university students being discontinued. It is not fair because uh, getting into drug use really isn't a mistake. The mistake is what we do after this person gets into drug use. I take it like all of us can use drugs. Some get addicted, some do not. Some are functional, some are not. So for the ones who get addicted, they need treatment. Uh, but I think people should also know that not all drug users are addicted and not all are non-functional. There are those that are very functional and they are uh, productive members of society. It, it is something that we need to look at as a society because again, if we want to offer treatment, what are we doing about the joblessness among the youth? What are we doing among us, um, the understanding of the society about the causes of uh, addiction? So if we want to come up with a comprehensive solution, we must also think of creating jobs for young people, expanding the healthcare system, and being comprehensive in a way that the family support system is also functional. Mm -hmm.